So we're looking at the events leading up to the Civil War. This is called the Gathering Storm. Remember, in the first half of the 19th century, Americans pushed west because, you know, the whole manifest destiny. Some believe that the United States was a special country whose fate was to expand to the Pacific Ocean, bringing its spreading, bringing its, spreading its values along the way. Um, this is called the manifest destiny. Not everyone agreed what the West should look like, especially when it came to allowing slavery in the newly admitted states. So let's look at slavery and sectionalism. The Constitution failed to take any definite position on the abolition, abolition of slavery, and that's because you are going to have different desires from the North and South. So states in the North began to outlaw slavery after the Revolution, and labor was paid. However, the North and South went down different economic paths. The North centered around manufacturing trade, and the South around agriculture, particularly cotton, was their moneymaker. Different cultures and values led to sectionalism, where you have loyalty to a region's North versus South interests rather than the U.S. as a whole. So they become a, basically a divided country. Um, you're going to have cotton, which is going to be called King Cotton. Eli Whitney's cotton gin allowed cotton to be separated from seeds much faster than by hand. So this is going to increase the demand for slaves to pick the cotton um, and it's also, you know, everything's going to increase. You're going to have demand for slaves increase, cotton increase, because now it's able to be produced at a faster rate, which is going to lead to several compromises, because now the cotton gin, cotton can be grown in any state now. It doesn't only have to be grown in southern states. The cotton gin allows cotton to be developed and grown in other states. Um, so every state that gets added to the union, the question is, can it be a slave state or a free state? Because it can be a slave state. So the first compromise is going to be called the Missouri Compromise. It was a delicate balance between um, a delicate balance existed between free and slave states. The North and South feared the other side gaining control. When when Missouri applied for statehood, that balance was threatened. Senator Henry Clay proposed a two-part compromise. He said Missouri will be admitted as a slave state, while Maine will be admitted as a free state. Slavery will be prohibited in territories of the Louisiana North of imaginary line at 3630 North Latitude. And prohibit means not allowed. So the compromise kept the balance of slave and free states, 12 each. During this time period, you're going to have the abolitionist movement, which sought to end slavery in the United States altogether in the South, too. This movement gained momentum and reached more people in the mid 1800s. Abolitionists used words, pictures, and personal acts of protest to attempt to end slavery. William Lloyd Garrison, the liberator, called for an end to slavery and criticized the government for allowing it to continue. Um, then you have Harriet Tubman. Many helped slaves escape to freedom in the North and Canada. This system became known as the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman was one of its well-known conductors, but there were several that helped her. Frederick Douglass, he encouraged Lincoln to make ending slavery the main goal of the war. So the Compromise of 1850, Congress was faced with the slavery question again after territory was gained from Mexico following the Mexican-American War. California was added as a free state. The people of the remaining land in Mexico and Utah territories would choose for themselves whether to allow slavery. This is called popular sovereignty where you leave it up to the people to decide if they want slavery to exist in the state they're selling. And they also passed a new Fugitive Slave Act that required the return of runaway slaves because of the success of the Underground Railroad. They wanted some something. The Southerners did that owned slaves that were escaping. They wanted some guarantee that they can get them back. You're going to have a book. It's a very, um, had a big impact. It's called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Although slave narratives, accounts of life as slaves from slaves themselves were very popular, the most read anti-slavery book was the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. The book depicted the life of a slave, Uncle Tom. Stowe, an abolitionist, sought to create a realistic portrayal of slavery. The book outraged pro-slavery readers and rallied some to the abolitionism. Some abolitionists felt Stowe's book didn't go far enough calling for the immediate end of slavery. So you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. Keep in mind, Harriet Beecher Stowe had never visited South at all. Um, so she used research to help write her book. 
the Kansas Nebraska Act is another basically domino in the events leading to the Civil War. The act repealed the Missouri Compromise, so it reversed it by allowing white male sellers to, to vote to allow slavery, popular sovereignty, because remember they couldn't settle above that line, but then the Kansas Nebraska um, Act changed the line the, um, and said, look, just leave it up to the state if they want to decide if they're going to have slaves, a slave, a slave state or a free state. Of course, this is going to outrage the anti-slavery supporters. Anti- and pro-slavery rushed to Kansas. Each side hoped it would defeat the other. When violence erupted, the territory became known as Bleeding Kansas. Um, Dred Scott is another um, is a Supreme Court case. Dred Scott, a slave, sued for his freedom in 1847. His case eventually made it to the Supreme Court in 1857. Scott argued his stay in Illinois and Wisconsin, which was free soil with his master for five years, should make him a free man. However, the Supreme Court said a black man was not a citizen of the U.S. and could not sue in court because he was property. So that's like your dog trying to sue you. So Scott was a property um, and will remain property even if in free territory. The government could not ban slavery in any U.S. territory like they had done in the Missouri Compromise because it violated the Fifth Amendment. Government can't take away property. That's your eminent domain. And slaves were seen as property at this time, not people. John Brown's raid. John Brown, he was, um, he devoted his whole life to abolishing slavery. He fell, he was a failed businessman, so he just wanted to get rid of slavery. John Brown had fought in Bleeding, Kansas. In 1859, he led 21 men to an arsenal in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, in an attempt to lead a slave uprising. His plan to, he, his plan to arm slaves failed. Brown was wounded at Harper's Ferry and captured. Brown was charged with treason and hanged. The, the South feared his action would be repeated. They began to take steps to protect themselves. Um, and this is like really going to be the final straw, the election of 1860. In 1860, the country was in turmoil. turmoil. Sectional political parties attempted to protect their region's interests. The relatively new Republican Party nominated Abraham Lincoln. Republicans wanted to stop the spread of slavery by banning it in the territories. The Democratic Party was in turmoil. A group of Southern Democrats split to form their own party. It strongly supported slavery. They nominated um, John Breckinridge. Lincoln won the election in November 1860. Lincoln stressed the importance of keeping the U.S. together and assured the South he would not abolish slavery in states where it already existed. This is the key. So he said he would never get rid of slavery or that he would not get rid of slavery in the states that already had slavery. He just said he wouldn't let slavery expand. But most in the South did not trust Lincoln, and some believed it was their right to leave the Union just as they joined it because they, because their way of life was under attack, which they believed their state rights were being violated. They thought Abraham Lincoln was going to come in and say slavery had to end in those states. So it's going to be a series of secession. It seems certain, but President James Buchanan did little to try to hold the country together because he was the 15th president. So when Lincoln becomes president, um, the southern states will start seceding. And that concludes this video.